everybody. Good to have everybody here for our virtual meeting. Uh, welcome, welcome. Um, Carol Hebert, the president of the Conradina chapter of the Native Plant Society, and welcome to our September meeting. Um, and of course, we usually start our meetings at the Melbourne Library. And as usual with this epidemic, things have changed our circumstances. Um, we're not sure when the Melbourne Library will reopen the meeting room. So most of our meetings throughout the end of this year will be online. They uh, only allow like 10 people in the meeting room and we know and we are so happy and so grateful that we always have more than 10 people. So welcome everyone tonight. Um, I want to start with the officers and the board members, and we all hope that, that everyone that we're speaking with um, and are watching are very healthy and staying safe. Tonight we have a wonderful guest, uh, Dr. Kate Wells, and she's going to address how native plants and what native plants you can have in your garden that will attract birds to your yard. Can't wait. So first we do have some business to cover. One thing is uh, this past May at the Florida Native Plant Society State Conference, which was the first time a state conference went virtual, our, Mar our Martha Stewart won the Green Palmetto Service Award. She did great. We just want to do a round of applause for her because we really appreciate all she has done. Uh, Martha is and has been our state representative to Florida Native Plant Society for many years. And she has a home in Lockmar in Palm Bay and has even been on our garden tour for several years. So bravo, bravo. And I can hear the applause like crazy out there. So um, next time you see her, we'll have to elbow rub or something and give her uh, uh, some applause. Um, and also we really thank Suzanne Valencia for electing her. So that was a big part. Florida Native Plant Society promotes the preservation, conservation, and restoration of native plants and the native plant communities of Florida. Usually this is a great part where I can introduce all of the board members and all of the officers and point to them in the back of their seat and see that they're not standing up yet and uh, they do a lot. So I'm just gonna say their names. So think of them and say howdy when you see them next time. Um, myself, of course, I'm Carol Hebert. Joe Sarmiento is our vice president. Jane Higgins is our um, treasurer. Catherine Mary is our secretary. And on our board is Suzanne Valencia, Martha Stewart, Sharon Dolan, Bo Platt, Jim Baldwin, Karen Moser, Dave Zeiss, Carl Weinberger, Linda Garassi, Leonard McRae, Stuart Weimer, Sarah Morrison, and Cami Donaldson. And we really appreciate that many people volunteering their time. Um, and it's a great bunch to work with. Um, and during this meeting every year uh, in September, we do an election for those that have served for two years and um, we have an election committee asking people if they'd like to continue or even look for some new people if they would like to join up. And we did have a great committee and this has already been sent out to you on email. And it was, by, it was sent by our webmaster, Stuart Weimer. And uh, take a look, maybe it's in your scam box or something if you don't recognize it. Um, but we do hope that you voted and we do thank you for participating um, and we'll send everybody the results. So um, it was kind of, again, another first time of doing this. So, all right, I'm gonna touch base on what's gonna happen next month during the month of, uh, of October. And that will be our next meeting on Monday, the 12th of October. And I'm gonna have Nicole Perna 
Uh, she's with the EEL program, assistant land management specialist at the Barrier Island Sanctuary. And she is going to be uh, speaking about the wonderful landscape that we helped add to the Barrier Island Nature Center. Um, we have a wonderful video prepared by Duncan Moore of 142 Productions that has Nicole's voice over it. And it will be the first part of our landscaping with Florida natives. And so that'll be a little touch of anticipation because we're going to do that Monday night, the 12th at six o'clock, like all our meetings. And we're going to have a little Q and A as we go through. Um, and then the other part will be on Saturday. Um, Saturday is the October 17th. Um, but again, with Nicole Perna at the Barrier Island Sanctuary, we do have to also applaud another board member we have, Catherine Mary. She is the one that did achieve the Keeper of Our Beautiful grant and helped get that um, for the second time and get all that landscaping, mostly in and around the, um, the parking area. So it's really made a beautiful, beautiful setting out there. And one more quick hint about the 11th annual Landscaping with Florida Natives. It's our first, our 11th garden tour. Um, and that will be Saturday, the 17th. And we're going to host four locations. These are homes, four locations, starting about 9 a.m. Again, it will be um, open for everyone and uh, to watch online, same place you're watching this. And we're going to take some questions and answers. And again, our first time. So we're going to hope like tonight goes well. And so we can keep on going with everything um, as we go. So I, um, unless I am not getting any comments yet, I, I don't see any coming in. Um, so feel free to post a comment. Um, I think I'm going to just go right into the to miss uh, our our speaker, and here we are with Kate Wells. Kate, how are you tonight? Hi, I'm good. Carol, how are you? I'm hanging in there. I'm nervous, you know, <laughs> trying to make sure everything goes well. I know uh, it's such an unusual way to hold a meeting, but I'm excited that meetings are back. I've missed them, so I'm I'm yes. glad to be here. Um, so. Before I start talking, I do want to mention to everyone who's watching that if you do have questions at any point, think of this like a meeting. So I know you can't raise your hand, but you can leave a comment or a question. Um, and so please feel free to type them in at any time. I'll try to be good about answering them as I go. If I miss one, I'm sure, Carol, you can stop me <laughs> and let me know that there is a question <laughs> I that one, I, yes. I didn't notice. Um, and then I'll leave some time at the end for questions. So Sounds good. Um, let me yeah. go ahead and just give you a quick introduction so they know who, who, I mean, we're all birding buddies, so we know each other. So I just thought I'd introduce you to everybody else, um, how she came from Rhode Island, a Rhode Island native. Uh, Dr. Kate Wells relocated to Florida in the summer of 2018. And she currently works as an environmental educator at Turkey Creek Sanctuary in Palm Bay and at Brevard County's Rotary Park Nature Center in Merritt Island. So she's she's done a lot and uh, gosh, they're fighting over her assets because she knows a lot of things about birds and plants. She is also the educational outreach director for the Space Coast Audubon Society. Kate's a lifetime birder and a nature lover. Tonight, her presentation is about tracting birds with native plants, and we'll introduce some of the birds that will visit your yard, what their best needs are, and how to create a bird-friendly habitat at home. She's gonna also share some tips and resources to creating your own landscape plan, including some examples of Brevard County's natives that will attract your feathered friends. So, if I may introduce Dr. Kate Williams. <laughs> Thanks, Carol. Um, there was the drum roll. 
<laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> so um, can you, I'm sorry, it's having a hard time saying, can you bring up my first slide? Absolutely. Awesome. Oops, get to screen. Perfect. There it is. Okay, now I just have to figure out how I can change slides. This is all good learning process. Okay, so gardening for birds. Um, I'd like to start what, by talking about just briefly, you know, why we should all be trying to attract more birds. Um, so let me see if I can get my slides to forward normally. Here we go. <laughs> okay. So, you know, according to the American Bird Conservancy, about a third of the species in the United States today are either endangered, threatened, or in serious decline. And um, even more concerning than that, Audubon, you know, does um, survey population surveys in different ways, and they're reporting a decline of about 25 to 30 percent of numbers, total numbers of birds across all species, even species that are not, you know, ones we consider in trouble. So what that translates to is that there are approximately 1 billion, with a B, fewer birds in the United States today than there were in 1970. Um, and, you know, obviously um, land is not the only reason, you know, obviously uh, development is not the only threat that birds are facing, um, but it's certainly one of the problems. Um, you know, about 60% of the United States is privately owned. And that percentage is even higher in Florida. So it's actually more like 70%. Um, and that the, you know, the acreage is not just being held by private landowners, it's being developed. You know, about 6,000 acres are developed in the country every day on average. And unfortunately, a lot of that development is turning vacant property, which might have native plants growing on it, into places that look a lot like the back of the slide, which may not contain any native plants. Uh, and so, you know, obviously, I feel like this next slide, I'm gonna be preaching to the choir. <laughs> uh, but, you know, not it's all plants one. have equal value to birds. Oh, what was that, Carol? It's a good one though. This is a great one. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I mean, we, we know, we are the Florida Native Plant Society. So we know that not all plants have equal value in Florida uh, to as far as, you know, wildlife and birds. Um, you know, native plants are part of the ancient ecosystem. And as such, they are significantly more valuable to the native wildlife. Uh, you know, this plant on the slide that many of you probably know and love uh, is happy in Florida grows great in our soil, likes our light conditions, our water levels. But from a wildlife perspective, it's essentially one of these. Um, <laughs> it doesn't really have much value, especially not the birds. So, um, you know, we want to plant native plants. I think we all know that here at the Native Plant Society. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what birds need. Um, the first thing I think a lot of people think about when they start wanting to have bring more birds to their yard is food, uh, feeding, food for birds. Um, and birds, are, obviously, we all need food, um, but birds, most of them are prey species. So birds don't just need food, they need protection. A uh, big part of what they're looking for when they survey an area is protection opportunities from predators, from the elements, you know, and also, of course, they're looking, a lot of them are looking for places to nest and nest materials like this bird. Oh my gosh, I feel like this hummingbird has found and made the perfect nest. <laughs> but, uh, you know, nesting sites, and of course, you know, we all know that birds are looking for food and water. So in order to give them that, I want to talk just very briefly about some kind of rules. I, there's not really rules for landscaping. There's uh, guidelines. Um, and the first one I list here is probably the most important guideline. Um, which is you need diversity in your plants and not just in types of species or, you know, different numbers of species in your yard, but also on a, from a vertical perspective, you want vertical diversity in your yard. Uh, if you notice the back of the slide, it's showing there are some ground cover plants, then there's some lower understory plants or shrub level plants, mid story, 
and under canopy or you know sub canopy and then canopy layer plants. So when you are landscaping your yard, you wanna think about that vertical diversity because those it's gonna provide a lot of different opportunities for different bird species. And then of course the others are just what I said. I mean, birds are looking for water, food, shelter and places to nest. So we'll go over all of those. Uh, let's start with plant diversity. <laughs> Um, this is not an example of plant diversity, obviously. Um, this is a lovely monoculture. And I'm not saying there are no birds that like yards. I mean, I had a great blue heron that you'll see in a little while who adored our grassy lawn. Um, white ibis go in the lawns, things like robins, which are only here seasonally, but they love lawns. Uh, mockingbirds and thrashers love my yard, but, but there aren't that many species that prefer yards and that's because of what I just talked about. Most of them feel very exposed. So we need some diversity. We need something that looks a little bit more like this. Um, and, you know, I say that everyone's yard is an opportunity for plant diversity. Even if you have a lot of serious restrictions or you have unhappy neighbors and they, they think that a yard like one of these is too messy looking or unkempt, even a yard like this meets that vertical diversity need. And I know this isn't a, a local, you know, this is not a Florida home, but I, I found this image and I thought this is a perfect example of what I'm saying, that even if you are under a lot of restrictions, maybe your homeowners association has you know, requirements for what you can do, this family or landscaper has done an excellent job of doing diversity in multiple layers. So you can see there's ground cover, understory, mid-story canopy. And I guarantee that wherever this house is, if these are native plants to the area that this yard attracts birds even with all that lawn. So it is possible. Um, second thing is regardless of what your yard looks like, the number one thing you can do besides plants is water sources for birds. Um, especially in Florida, fresh water is at a premium. And if you put fresh water sources out there, you will get more birds. You can put I out- I love this picture. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> oh, somebody, uh, Kathleen says, can you see this? And yes, I can see this. Oh, good. <laughs> uh, so uh, yes, that's where you would ask your questions. If you have them, feel free to type those right in there. Um, so fresh water, um, you know, you can do standing basins like this chipping sparrow on the left or hanging basins like the cardinal on the right. But whatever you decide as far as if it's a standing still water source, just don't forget about mosquitoes, bacteria, you know, change that water a lot, especially in the summer months. Um, or if, you know, the better option is really to have running water in some way. So it may be hard to see on the left, but what that is actually an image of is a mister. Uh, birds love misters. I mean, they're great for your plants too, but birds will bathe in misters. And uh, so misting is a great option. Also putting in a pump in your fountain, like that mockingbird is standing next to a pump. Um, or if you have a potential space for a, a water feature, adding running water to the water feature really brings in a lot more birds. And I'll talk more about the benefits of water features in a second, but you know, obviously that's gonna bring in a lot more species uh, if you have the room for one. Okay, so third thing uh, I said birds are looking for, well, I guess third and fourth thing <laughs> is cover, shelter and nest sites. Um, so, when most of our uh, nesting species here are looking for sites in, in suburban habitats, they're looking for shrubs. They're looking for hedgerows. Um, this is actually a laurel cherry or cherry laurel. I'm not sure the right way to say that, but it is. Um, it, notice it's all one species, which looks very nice, but it's not a requirement for your bird's perspective for you to have all the same species in your row. But what you want is shrubs that are planted close together that are approximately three to eight feet in height and that are, it, you know, essentially, I know evergreen is pretty easy to achieve in Florida, but you will want something that's not gonna lose its leaves so it doesn't lose that cover. Um, and the more inaccessible the plant is to larger predators, like if it's thorny or if the branches grow really close together and overlapping, and cats can't get in there and larger birds can't get in there, that's where it's gonna make it the most attractive to nesting species and uh, species using these as little highways, which they do. The sparrows will use these as ways to get from one side of your yard to another without being exposed. 
Um, I have some other suggestions for cover. Not going to work with every yard. Uh, you know, obviously, if you have the room, um, you have a place you can put a brush pile. These are excellent for attracting birds. Birds are looking to hide, but also to hunt. These are great places to find little morsels for them. Um, if you do have room for a brush pile, make sure that you put it somewhere where you can actually see it from your yard. Um, because I mean, from your, from your house, excuse me. Cause you know, if you put your brush pile in the back corner, you'll never get to appreciate its bird, uh, attracting ability. <laughs> um, but put it far from the house cause it attracts other things too, like rodents. You don't want them coming close by. Um, another, um, option if you can, if you have room is to leave dead trees, which we nicely call snags, but they're really just dead trees. They are logs that haven't fallen down yet. And because they ha haven't, you know, because they're essentially just a log, that's a dead tree. It's not, it doesn't have any defenses from insects. That's why it's so popular with birds because it's full of insects. So, um, you know, cavity nesters like woodpeckers are gonna love snags. So you can see the holes drilled in this one, but they're not the only ones that use it. Um, these things get used as lookout towers and, you know, places to sing from and places to, announce your presence and also to make sure there's no predators and things around. So this is a um, house bear, uh, excuse me, a house wren that I was birding and this guy hopped right up onto this snag to stare me down. So, you know, they're great opportunities. If I mean, I even know some people who intentionally stand up dead sticks in their yard to provide more snags for their birds around their bird feeders because they're so great at drawing in extra birds, so. Okay, and um, now we get into plant food sources, of course. I mean, I had said food is one of those things that birds do look for. <laughs> they might not be looking for it, uh, They, you know. Um, sorry, give me one second. Uh, here we go. Sorry, I was looking at some notes. Um, they, uh, you know, they're looking for water, they're looking for shelter, but they are, of course, always on the hunt for some extra food. So if you plant, things that create um, seeds and nuts, you're gonna see the kinds of birds that you would see at feeders. Things like cardinals, sparrows, finches, um, nut hatches, grosbeaks, buntings, uh, doves, woodpeckers, stuff like that. Um, if you have acorns, you'll get things like jays and even turkeys visiting those. Um, if you plant for berries and fruits, you are going to see so many species, especially when it's not nesting season. Everything I just mentioned that eats seeds and nuts will also eat berries and fruits, except for probably the doves. Um, <coughs> excuse me. In addition, cedar waxwings, which is that really pretty bird right below the note eating that um, purple berry. Um, the robins and thrushes that come around in the winter. The catbirds, thrashers, mockingbirds, they all love berries. Even things that eat flies, like flycatchers, um, insect eaters, like vireos and orioles and wrens, they love berries and fruits. Um, and then finally, you know, a lot of people like to plant for nectar or sap. And of course, nectar is what's going to bring in your hummingbirds. Not a lot of birds can actually digest nectar and sap. Um, the carbohydrates are only accessible to a few species, but you know, they're the pretty ones like the hummingbirds. <laughs> um, sap is, um, yellow-bellied sapsucker is the one on the left there drinking sap off that tree. I'm a big fan of sap. Personally, I put maple sap on my pancakes all the time. Um, but maples and pecans and birches make sap. So do elms, oaks, and even pines. Um, so, you know, planting for those food sources or you can try to attract animals to your yard. Um, I mentioned that great blue heron. <clears throat> That's the great blue heron in my front yard that eats snakes right out of the grass whenever he can find them. But you know, fish, rodents, frogs, lizards, those kinds of things are sources of food for certain birds. And if you put in those brush piles and those water sources that I was mentioning, you will encourage those foods to visit your yard. Um, but the number one food source that birds are looking for is gonna be bugs, insects and spiders. 
I mean, the number of bugs eaten by birds each year is truly staggering. They, they estimate it is around 400 million tons of insects worldwide every year. Um, in addition, 96% of the land birds in North America feed bugs to their babies. So if you want birds, you need bugs. <laughs> That's the key. That's the secret. If you're feeding birds is you got to find bugs. Um, and so that means native plants. That's where we're back to native plants. I mean, native plants means more bugs, right? Um, you know, there's this very well-known professor, you've probably heard of him, uh, Doug Ptolemy. He's from the University of Delaware, and he actually went out and measured. He's done a lot of research on the linkage between native plants, bugs, and birds. And he measured uh, insect load in different kinds of trees, and he found that in oaks, there were over 500 different species of insects that were visiting the oaks, uh, whereas in the same neighborhood, Asian ginkgos, he could count five species of insects visiting those. So, I mean, the reason is just because native insects are part of that same ancient ecosystem and their enzy the enzymes in their digestive tracts tend to be specific to the plants in their ecosystem. So, you know, like this, for example, this monarch butterfly caterpillar on the right is eating milkweed and it's a preferred food for them because, I mean, it's the only food for them because that's what they can digest. So, you know, plants just can't be interchangeable from the perspective of the insects. They need the native plants. So if you have more native plants, you'll get more bugs. And I know, again, I know I'm talking to the Native Plant Society, so I don't feel like I, this is as scary to maybe some of the viewers as it would be <laughs> to the general population. But usually when I say plant natives, you'll get more bugs in your yard. Most people are not immediately <laughs> excited. Um, yeah. yeah. They're like, ah, the very hungry caterpillar will destroy my yard <laughs> and all my expensive natives. Uh, but truly more bugs, but less damage. You know, I mean, insect damage is normal on all trees. And even though I just said that insects can digest the plants that they're, they have, you know, evolved to digest, but there are still, you know, plants that some bugs can get at. Um, and insect damage is normal, whether you are planting exotics or natives. But um, one of the other things that Dr. Ptolemy discovered was that there's actually a lower percentage of damage on the native species um, because of native predators. So, you know, birds are smart. They know they are looking for native plants because that's where the bugs are. So you end up with overall less damage on your plants, uh, even though you're attracting more insects. Um, you hey, know? We did get a person to log in. We're getting a little bit of uh, friction. We're not getting a lot. But it was great because Margo just said how I love caterpillars. So that that Yay. was a good input we got too. So oh good. Is it am I not seeing that one? Maybe let me get it try to get up there. Okay. I have this weird oh thanks, Margo. There we go. Look, see, that's my problem. I'm trying to uh see my both screens at the same time. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. I love caterpillars too. Um, and so do birds. So um, okay, so uh, Dr. Ptolemy, I know I keep using his research, but he really has done so much on this. So um, basically, you know, he's um, did he did some great research with the Carolina chickadee, um, showing that they they have such a strong preference for native trees um, and the native trees that have the most caterpillars, like the oaks. And um, not surprisingly, they were going to nest as close as possible. Hi, Jane. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this Carolina chickadee, you may or may not have seen this bird before. It's not very common in Brevard. They come through, but you don't see them very much. It's kind of rare when people, you know, report having seen one in Brevard. But they are a resident of northern Florida. And they are these tiny, adorable little birds you can tell by their bill that they like insects. They have a tiny pointy little insect eating bill like a warbler. They are little bitty birds. They only weigh about a third of an ounce, um, 10 grams when they're grown. And yet um, they uh, feed their babies. Let me try to get this out of here. There we go. They feed their babies 
so many cats. You're not going to believe this next <laughs> number. So a nest of babies will eat about six to 9,000 caterpillars in the first two weeks after they hatch. So for five chicks, that's about 20 to 25,000 grams um, or 450 times their body weight each in two weeks. Um, and so, you know, obviously it makes sense why the Carolina chickadee nests as close as it can possibly get to the source of those caterpillars, because that is a lot of work. So uh, anyway, that's my point. If you want birds, you want bugs, you want to attract as many bugs as you can, it will bring them in. So with that said, um, I'd like to switch now to talking about which plants. Um, I do feel I need a disclaimer at this point, though. A couple of disclaimers. First is I focused on Brevard. So I'm assuming our watchers are from Brevard and part of the Plant Society membership. But it is possible that someone is watching who is not from Florida. And if you are, welcome. Um, but if you, <laughs> if you are not from the same hardiness zone as what the plants I'm bringing up, that's okay because I really want to focus on it's kind of my second disclaimer. Um, you want plants that are good for your yard, not so much that are the names of the species that I'm about to say. You know, obviously the ones I'm bringing up are just examples within categories. I really want you to focus on the vertical diversity aspect. I'm going to, you know, mention some categories um, and what some examples in Brevard would be of those categories. But know your hardiness zone. Obviously, Brevard has more than one. If you are along the coast, you're in a different hardiness zone than if you're inland. Uh, also, know your soil conditions, your light conditions, your moisture conditions. Worry more about those than about the names of the plants that I'm about to say, because there's no magic group of, bur of uh, plants. There's no magic list. There's no top 10 list. And uh, Dr. Craig Hugel, if anyone's ever heard him talk, he said something I really appreciated in February, I heard him speak. And he said, if everybody planted the same 10 plants because they were listed as the top 10 plants for attracting fill in the blank, there would be no diversity. <laughs> then we want diversity, not just in our yards, but across our neighborhoods and communities. So, you know, Take my list with a grain of salt. They're just examples, I promise. But the categories are what you want to get out of this. So let's start with category number one, which is the ornamental grasses. I highly recommend planting some ornamental grasses for birds. And I'll tell you why in a second. So some examples in that category is this lovely muley grass. Perhaps um, love grasses are your thing. Or maybe you like switch grasses. Uh, maybe you like fake grass, or maybe you're into blue stems, like this broom sedge blue stem, or uh, there are others. Um, isn't there one called Shaggy or something? Uh, or <laughs> Scraggy or some crazy name. There's a bunch of blue stems. So, you know, what you want to notice, though, about these ornamental grasses is no matter which genus we're talking about, they have these couple of qualities that they produce, obviously, small seeds. And if you look, at, especially at that switchgrass on the right, they provide cover. They're a great place for small birds to go in hunting for insects. And then when they produce seeds, they're going to attract things that eat small seeds. So, um, you know, this is a, a swamp sparrow on the right eating seeds uh, off of some plants. And then on the left, I wish I had an audience I could talk to, or, or you know, I guess you guys could write in the comments, but usually I quiz my audience to see if they know what this not the best picture I've ever taken on the left is, but I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> I'm just gonna tell you. Um, that is a painted bunting. I think everybody knows what the males look like, but this is a female or possibly an immature male. Um, and it was going nuts on these grass seeds when I was taking this picture and I wish I had gotten a little bit better photo but at least you can see the the um, the seeds came out nicely in focus uh, but anyway my point is ornamental grasses are a great place to attract some of these small seed eaters so wintering sparrows blackbirds finches um, also the gross beaks and of course the painted buntings which everybody wants to attract okay um, so second category after ornamental grasses is wildflowers. And I mean, there are literally hundreds of wildflowers that you could work with, you know, and they're so attractive to bugs. I'm, I feel that I need to always plug milkweeds um, 
for those of you, oh, Carol, I can hear something. I'm not sure what, <laughs> the little feedback there. Um, thanks. So um, I always feel like I need to plug milkweeds because I don't know if you guys know, but the monarch population is so low at this point that there are fewer monarchs wintering in Mexico now than, than usually die off when they have a bad freeze, which suggests that one poorly timed storm could wipe out the entire Eastern population in one fell swoop. So if you like monarchs and you want them to be around, you need to plant milkweeds. So I don't normally plug specific species, but I'm still not. I'm just plugging milkweeds as a group. I know there are a number of milkweeds that are native to Florida and they're all long lived perennials that are pretty, but they don't usually get planted. They, these, are, these are ditch plants. They grow in roadside ditches and vacant lots. And then when they lots get developed, not a lot of people put the milkweeds back. So if you like monarchs, put back milkweeds, at least two plants, so they'll pollinate. And, um, you know, that's kind of a my one soapbox. I'm going to get off of the soapbox now, though. So I'm going to say, in addition to milkweeds, of course, there are hundreds. So I'll just throw out some suggestions, things like beard tongues or sages, um, like this salvia has a hundred different common names, but one of them happens to be butterf uh, butterfly sage, actually. Um, false dragon head or the obedient plant kind of looks like foxglove. There's blue curls. If you're into blue stuff, there's blue sages. There's also like this is um, a forked blue curl. Maybe you're into yellows. You want to plant goldenrods or uh, partridge pea. Uh, perhaps you're into purple and you want to plant thistle, which goes to seed and creates little seeds that the goldfinches like and the pine siskins. Um, maybe you like porter weeds instead, but make sure you get the native porter weed, not the one that you find commercially. That's not usually the native one. Uh, or blanket flower, also known as firewheel, also has 800 other common names. <laughs> um, and then the sunflowers, that whole Asteraceae group, the sunflowers, the black-eyed Susans, those are awesome because they not only attract insects, like all the wildflowers are gonna attract the insects when they're flowering, um, they're also gonna go to seed. And I can't, I don't even have numbers on how much money people spend on sunflower seed, but if you just plant sunflowers, then they make seeds all you know, for you. You don't have to buy any sunflower seeds. Uh, and so for that, you're gonna get for your wildflowers, you're obviously going to get nectar drinkers if you plant tubular type flowers like this ruby throated hummingbird, which is showing off his tongue so you can see how he gets to the bottom of those flowers. Um, and uh, if anybody doesn't know, uh, the ruby throated hummingbird, or I guess all hummingbirds, on average visit one to 2,000 flowers a day. So if you put in tubular flowers, you will probably be getting hummingbirds sooner rather than later because they are always looking. Um, and then of course, I just mentioned that the, the seed heads on things like thistles and sunflowers are gonna attract things like pine siskins and goldfinches like this guy here and anything else that likes sunflower seeds. Okay, category three is the vines. Um, and there are, you know, obviously depending on the vine, you might be creating a berry fruit, you know, source of food, like this Virginia creeper, when it gets ripe, this is going to obviously attract a lot of birds. Um, or maybe you're looking for nectar drinkers. So you might plant a cross vine or jessamine or morning glory, if you're looking for a they, you know, that'll attract insects, but it'll also attract hummingbirds. Um, you know, we know that the passiflora vines, um, there's more than one kind, but the uh, may pops are so popular with insects. I mean, these actually attract the hummingbirds because they're such a great source of food for, you know, there's so many insects attracted to them. Um, and so insect eaters is what I decided to focus on here. But again, some of the vines are berry producing, but um, I really, I am really appreciative of um, John Hartgrink. He's mentioned in a tiny little spot in the bottom left corner. Uh, he's a good friend who took these amazing photos of these birds enjoying insects. And this is usually a spot where I ask the audience if they can tell what it is. But I will just say before I tell you what it is, that the tufted titmouse on the right is actually removing the stinger because he's a smart little guy, um, because these guys are eating bees. And um, plenty of birds eat bees, actually. And I don't know how many of them think to remove the stinger, but uh, 
this bird on the left is actually a um, summer tanager. And uh, I just thought these were such cool pictures by my friend John. I had to put them in here. But birds love insects, so they will come to anything that attracts insects. Okay, category four is the smaller shrubs. And by that, I mean they don't generally grow above eight feet on their own. Um, so things like American Beautyberry, which I know people think perhaps that they don't attract birds, the berries, because the berries persist for months. And people are like, my birds don't eat these. But I like to call Beautyberry bird broccoli because, you know, the fruit itself doesn't have a lot of flesh and it's not very sweet. So it's kind of the last thing that they go after. But when they're hungry and they've used up all the other berries in your garden, they will come to beauty berry. I promise lots of birds like it, <laughs> but it's bird, birdie you, broccoli. What? Which type of bird have you seen eating that? I can name one in my yard. Oh boy. Well, so have I seen eating? Not so much, but I'm going to talk Beauty about berry? that in just a minute, actually. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah, I'll come back to that question because I'm going to talk about how you can find out what kinds of birds like the different things. Okay. I have not seen a lot of different birds personally after the Beauty Berry, but I do know that they eat it. I promise. <laughs> and what am I missing one? I have berries on my wild coffee, but I've never seen birds. Well, that is coming up too. It's the same kind of thing. Um, it just depends on what the food sources are. So, you know, it may be that in different years, different birds are looking more for certain berries or, you know, maybe there's an insect, plenty of insects and they're not really looking at the berries. Um, so it really just is kind of dependent, but they, these are definitely things that birds will eat. Uh, and it kind of just depends on what their other options are. Um, Lantana makes a nice hedgerow. Obviously you want the native Lantana. Um, which I didn't put the species in, but you, want, you don't want uh, the non-native invasive lantanas like Lantana camara. That's a bad one. But you do want, yeah, look for a native lantana. Um, wild coffee, which was just mentioned by, sorry, Margo. Um, again, um, Audubon recommends the shiny leaf wild coffee as far as, you know, which of the two types. But um, I actually have been told that birds visit both of them. So um, I don't know if that really matters if it has to be shiny leaf. Uh, yellow necklace pod will make um, some nice food options. And you know, don't forget these flower before they go to seed. So they have kind of double whammy stuff, all of these. Um, the firebush obviously is a popular bird and bear, you know, produces again, tubular flowers, insects love it, then it goes to, to seed if you are berries come out and they're popular too um, and then we have the coral bean so again in the shrub category you get the idea it depends on what kind of thing it's producing the same for our next category which is tall shrubs um, so a lot of the ones I'm mentioning are going to be berry producers but taller shrubs are things that go over eight feet if you don't cut them back so obviously elderberry produces a ton of berries I mean so many that it, they the heads fall over. Oh, let's see. Sorry, Margo, you have shiny leaf. The berries are kind of inside the bushes instead of very obvious on the outside. Interesting. Maybe, maybe that does have something to do with why the birds are not seeing them. Perhaps I'm really not sure. But they should be attracting birds. But again, I really um, maybe it's just because they have other food options in the area and they're not going to them. Um, but what I was going to say about elderberry is, of course, you can eat it too. Just cook it. Uh, <laughs> you can also eat the next thing I'm going to say, but uh, I guarantee that if you plant this for birds, you will not get a chance to get any, which is blueberries. Um, birds like blueberries so much that if you've ever visited a blueberry farm, you know it is covered in bird netting because they just strip the trees bare. So a good option if you're looking to feed the birds is the blueberry. Um, Oh, there you go, Kirk. Thank you. Mockingbirds come for the beauty berries late in the season. Again, I'm not surprised it's late in the season. They definitely save them till the end. But that just means as a gardener that you get to enjoy this beautiful purple berries for a long time before the birds come and steal them all. Unlike blueberries, which will probably not even get a chance to be blue before the birds have stripped them off the branches. Uh, so uh, Florida privet, another thing that makes a nice hedge or, you know, a nice cover for birds. Um, Simpson stopper, if you're, you know, if you're looking for coastal species. Um, Dahoon holly makes lots of berries. So does wax myrtle. 
wax myrtle is one of those things that there's actually a bird that's kind of named after its love of wax myrtle, um, which is this bird here on the left. So this bird has the not so awesome name of yellow rumped warbler, but it was used it used to be called the myrtle warbler. And in, you know, because of that, they still call it the myrtle subspecies, but um, loves, loves, loves wax myrtle along with a lot of other birds. And then of course, on the right, we have our state bird enjoying berries. And that is the Northern Mockingbird, which I guess Kirk says will also come for beauty berries. So that's perfect. Um, good timing. Okay, next category is trees. Of course, now we're up into the high, the canopy. I had to put in a picture of a live oak in the background, but I know that live oaks are not something that every yard can handle, but there are oaks of all different sizes in Brevard. Um, and you might even have really sandy soil and can put in some types of scrub oaks that don't grow over six feet, like a sand live oak or Chapman's oak or something. But there are a number of native oaks. And so, uh, you know, oaks are by far one of the best insect attractors out there. So if you can put in oaks, go for it. Um, as far as fruits, by far the prunus genus is going to produce the fruits that birds want the most. They are the juiciest fruits. They have the most flesh around the seed. So we have a native laurel cherry. We have a native hog plum. Um, also, if you're looking to plant for seeds and nuts, you know, consider the hickory group. That's um, like pig nut hickory. Uh, hickories are obviously hard to get into, so you're going to attract birds that have a heavy beak, like a woodpecker or jays and, you know, gross beaks and things can handle hickories. Smaller nuts or, you know, easier to get into nuts would be the pecans, but not everybody has the right growing conditions for pecans, but if you can grow them, they're great because they're softer shells, so the birds can get into them easier. Um, sugarberry. Oh, I love this. My favorite tree, I think. Sometimes people call them hackberries, but I called it sugarberry here because of its berry, uh, which I'll talk about in a second. But it is also a larval host species, or you know, tree for several species of butterflies. So larval host plant, you definitely have multiple reasons to plant sugarberry. But just the name, the reason it's called nicknamed sugarberry is because the berries are so heavily laden with with fruit. Uh, sorry, with like uh, syrup. And it actually comes out of the berry and coats them. And the birds go absolutely bonkers for these berries because they're so sweet and delicious. So, you know, consider those. Um, or if you're looking, again, I mentioned the sap making trees, maples, box elders, pines, you're going to get sap from those. But also they all, all the types of trees are going to attract insects, which is going to bring in birds. While we're talking about trees, I have to put in, a, it's kind of a subcategory, but don't forget about palms. Not all of them are gonna per, be tree size though. I mean, some of our palms are really more of palmettos. So um, they're gonna perform more of a shrub role in your garden. So like this, this is a needle palm in the background. And then, you know, there's also saw palmetto depending on your conditions and saw palmetto can grow aggressively. So you wanna be, <laughs> consider that as well. Um, but it is great for birds. They love the berries. They also love the berries of cabbage palm, our state tree. You can see all the berries on this particular picture. Um, so, and also cabbage palms are really popular nesting spots for a lot of different native birds. Um, and woodpeckers especially like palms because they can drill into the corky interior a lot more easily than they can get into the hardwood interiors of the other trees. So, you know, consider palms, but also consider that these three palms, I want to make sure I don't say this wrong. These three palms are, I think, the only three that naturally occur in hardiness zone nine. Um, so, you know, there are other, a couple more that are common in the area. And then, of course, there's like a half a dozen more that are native to South Florida, but might be able to grow like royal palms and things. But for hardiness zone nine, these are the three native palms, I am, as far as I know. So just consider don't add introduced species when you get to palms. It seems like they're all supposed to be here, but try for natives. Okay, um, let's talk about birds. What species visit yards? And I guess before I get into this, I'll leave this pretty picture up there and say, does anyone have questions at this point about the categories of plants before I hop into this last bit 
about birds. <laughs> We're starting to um, get just a few people, but I heard people are having a little bit of trouble uh, getting online. Instead okay. Of just grabbing it, you know, from the newsletter to just go ahead. If you talk to anybody, please just go to Conradina Grandiflora on our YouTube. Or when you go to YouTube, just say Conradina and it'll pull you in and um, yep. hopefully join us. So. I'm going to let you take it over there, Kate. I just thought I'd give oh, you no, that. Oh, that's actually great. That's how I found it when we first were practicing this out was I went to YouTube and I just typed in Conradina and it came up. So good, good, yeah. good. But I'm not seeing any comments from the folks who are watching right now. So again, there's, I'll ask for questions at the end too, but I just figured I'd ask now. Um, I know I'm kind of hammering through things. Um, so I just wanted to talk about which kinds of species you might get in your yard. I mean, there are a little over 500. Oh, do birds eat mangoes? Ooh, good question. I don't recall anybody saying mangoes. That perhaps fallen ones, but I would think the birds would be more attracted to the the insects that would come to that tree than the mangoes themselves. I don't know of any birds that I've heard of eating mangoes. Wouldn't it oh. be more of a bite size fruit? Yes, they're they usually into berry mango? fruits, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, we don't find a lot. It's from what I know, I mean, people who grow peaches or apples or pears, they don't usually talk to me about bird um, activity on their fruits. They talk about insect activity, which would attract the birds, but the birds would then be providing kind of a natural pesticide rather than a, um, like with berry growers who are constantly complaining about birds. Um, but yeah, I don't think birds go to the mangoes themselves, probably to the mango trees. Yes. So um, anyway, so what I was saying about um, our Florida birds is that there are a little over 500 species of birds that pass through Florida in the year, which if you remember my first slide, there are a little over 800 species of birds in the United States. So seeing over 500 of them is pretty impressive. They're not all gonna come to your yard. No matter what your yard looks like, you will not get all 500 species. Um, some of those are open ocean birds and things like that, but you can get a lot of birds. Um, so I just want to mention some year round yard birds that are pretty common. So first thing is going to be some woodpeckers. We have several species of woodpecker that stay year round. This one on the left is the red bellied woodpecker, but, um, you'll also hear and see pileated woodpeckers and downy woodpeckers. Uh, and the next one over is the brown thrasher, which is a loves the grass kind of birds hopping around in the lawn all the time. Um, also mockingbirds, a very similar looking bird. They're in the same family of birds, but it's gray. Um, cardinals and blue jays and Carolina wrens, even ruby-throated hummingbirds are actually year round. Um, there are, uh, of course, the wading birds that we are all familiar with. I put the white ibis here at the top right, but you know, all of our egrets, herons, and those things are, can be yard birds, depending on your yard. Um, <clears throat> Also, there are a few species of wood warbler, like this This one is the smallest warbler in North America. At the bottom right is actually the Northern Perula. Um, but there's the black and white warbler, the common yellow throat, a couple others that will stay year round and they love insects. So, um, And then of course, things like Cooper's hawks and barred owls are also gonna be year round predator birds. In the summer, we get some more species, um, blue grosbeaks, that bottom left, um, the orchard oriole is the next one over. That's an Eastern kingbird on the bottom right. And on the top right is a red-eyed vireo. And um, in the migration seasons, which is what we're coming into right now, you're gonna see even more. Um, there are over 20 different wood warbler species that pass through um, pretty much all of them are wearing yellow to make them impossible to tell apart. Um, but these three uh, on the left, we have the hooded warbler, and below that the Tennessee warbler, and then the magnolia warbler in the middle, hanging out on an acer tree, just to be confusing instead of a magnolia. Um, 
Then we have a common migrator called the scarlet tanager, that beautiful red bird below the warbler. And then on the right side, we have the rose-breasted grosbeak, another beautiful bird. Um, what I wanted to show on this slide is if you look at faces, can give you an idea of what the migrators are going to be looking for because they're in a hurry and they're hungry. Uh, the, the wood warblers, obviously, if you look at their little beaks, they're going to be into insects, um, but they'll also stop for berries a lot of times. Um, things like the tanagers are going to be a mixed bag. They'll eat seeds. They'll eat insects. The rose-breasted grosbeak, obviously, is a seed eater and is going to be looking for seed-bearing plants or feeders. Um, and then in the winter, we actually live in one of the places in the United States where many birds come to spend the winter. When they say they fly south to the, for the winter, they mean here. So um, almost 150 different species of birds over winter in Florida, along with many people. <laughs> so um, we call these snowbirds. No, I'm just kidding. So uh, they include things like the pine siskin like the, that's on the left. And that was the one I mentioned likes thistles. Again, if you look at these beaks, you can get a feel for what they're after. The um, cedar waxwing we saw earlier has those cool little red wax droplets on its wings. That's after berries. Um, the savannah sparrow there at the top right is gonna be looking for those small seeds plants as the grasses go to seed. And then wrens, like this little winter wren, and of course there's the house wren and the marsh wren, they're all coming looking for insects. And so we want to consider our snowbirds um, when we're planting gardens and thinking about what, what to do with our gardens. Um, yay, we do see a lot of snowbirds, I agree. <laughs> um, this is, these kinds of plants are critical for them because you know, we often forget how important winter habitat is for birds. We, we think about what they need when they are migrating or when they're breeding, raising a family. But for wintering birds, um, the their success in the winter determines their success in breeding season. So the better they off they have it for, you know, from us in Florida, the better they'll do in their breeding habitats. So um, basically what I'm saying is please keep your garden a mess so that you know, let everything go to seed and don't pick up your leaf litter, have a messy winter garden. Uh, it's good for the birds. Uh, it's great for the bugs. And that's what this is really all about, right? So you know, our insects overwinter in these kinds of situations. They, um, most of the moth species in North America overwinter in leaf litter. Even in Florida, they, they have a winter season um, and they have their egg cases and their cocoons all in this kind of messy garden setup. So we don't wanna, obviously wanna leave the seed heads for the birds to eat, but you also are providing critical um, insect habitat. And trust me, the birds, if you can manage to leave your leaf litter or your mulch undisturbed, the birds will come in there and kick it around like crazy. It's hilarious to watch because they know that's where the bugs are. Uh, so I'm just basically encouraging you to do less yard maintenance, especially in the winter. <laughs> um, okay, so with all of that said, I just want to finish off by giving some um, direction on places to look for plants because I had said, you know, don't use my list. You've got to make a list that works for you. So if you have not used our website, it is amazing. Uh, I feel like it's probably one of the one, the one of the websites I use the most heavily in understanding the plants of this area when I started learning about this. Um, so if you haven't used it, I'm just going to go through a couple of slides, just screenshots real quick. Um, so you go to fnps.org slash plants and you can choose, you know, if you notice on the left, it says you can find a specific plant or browse all the plants. But if you want to make a list, I recommend starting on this side and putting in your county. And then once you do that, you're going to get a screen that looks like this. Um, and it asks for more information about your light and water and soil needs and any other specialty information that you want. Now you don't have to check any of these. You can leave them all blank and you'll get a full list of the Brevard natives. But if you, you know, reduce the list down with some of these categories and then you click get list, you will get as long or short of a list as you want. But if you notice, um, it's divided by vertical diversity layers, which I love. So, you know, I clicked a couple things to get this list to be manageably small. 
Um, but it has a list of the trees and then the shrubs and then the flowers and it goes on. It has other categories as well. Um, it's an awesome resource. I highly recommend it. And, you know, it has so many little features, like if it's a smiley face, it's a landscape favorite. I love that. But you can pick a specific one. And if you notice, the, the Latin name is in green because you can click on that. So if you click on the Latin name, say, for wild coffee, you then get another page of amazing resource information. It's awesome. So more than just a list, you get so much about these plants. Pictures, some specifics about their size and color and their landscape uses, where you can get them, how to propagate them. It tells you right here at the top. And then again, later on, what kind of wildlife value they have. They attract birds and butterflies. Um, and then also I didn't, this is a screenshot, so I can't scroll, but lower on this same page, it will give you all this stuff like your light needs, moisture and salt tolerances, what kind of soils it prefers and what kind of habitat it's normally found in. So you know if it's gonna be right for your area, you know, and also it's natural range across Florida as well as its hardiness zones. I love this website. I'm not just plugging it because it's it, tonight's the Florida Native Plant Society meeting. I plug this website every time I give this talk to anyone. So uh, anyway, I really highly recommend using our own website as a resource. Uh, but in addition, there are a couple of others I wanna mention. Audubon has a native plant finder. So if you go to audubon.org, yay. <laughs> and then you type in uh, native dash plants. Um, this is the same kind of thing, but it's it's nationally. And this is what you had asked Carol a ways back about how to find out about beautyberry, for example. So I'm actually gonna show you that right now. So the only thing you actually have to enter on this is your zip code for those who aren't really comfortable putting in their email, they will still let you do your search. You just put in your US zip code and hit search and it will give you your results. It will give you tabs at the top, best results, 47 spe uh, species of plants, but then there's 304 for the full results for that zip code. Um, but then you can see there are drop down menus where you can filter by, you know, the type of bird you want to attract or whether you want it to be a tree or a shrub under the all types of plants on the first one. Um, but it, this is what I was thinking about when you asked the question about beautyberry is like this is exactly what you get with Audubon. So beautyberry, it tells you a little bit about it and then it tells you which birds it attracts. <laughs> uh, so you can see that things like, according to this, you're getting jays, um, grosbeaks, finches, mockingbirds, thrashers, thrushes, waxwings. Those are the types of birds that like beautyberry. Excellent. Wow, yeah. that's detail, and that's Audubon's. Yeah, good, excellent. Oh, uh, Jim Baldwin says, FNPS has changed their webpage, but I know that I was still able to access this yeah, when no, I was it, making this. It is different. It's just they're in the process of doing it. Um, it just looks a little different way you can access it. So I wouldn't worry about it right at this moment, but it's very true that that is going under a little bit of a change. Will you still be able to use that um, FNPS slash plants? Yes. yes. Okay. It just is got a different panel and it have the um, uh, the menu is set up a tiny bit different and just to give a new, more um, aggressive look, I guess. Okay, cool. Um, nice. So I'm just trying to make sure I can still see the chat. It's getting away from me. So that's why I look like I'm off in space <laughs> looking at the other screen. Sorry. Um, okay, third resource for those who are still not convinced that they have enough information. Uh, I have more. Let me just get back to my slideshow here. Um, we have the National Wildlife Federation also has a native plant binder. And, you know, it says it's in beta, which what that actually means, I mean, it's fully operational. It's just missing plant pictures. A lot of the pictures are not quite there yet. But what I love about their native plant finder is that they sort their results based on the number of insect species each plant uh, attracts. And they also separate by category, trees versus shrubs and stuff like that. But they, you know, I didn't do a screenshot from them, but if you go in and you click, you know, find native plants, you just same kind of thing. You just put in a zip code, 
they sort by the number of insects that you will attract by giving, you know, using certain plants. It's pretty cool. So I recommend any of these. I've used them all. Um, so I would just like to finish up by saying, you know, thank you to all of these groups. So basically I would say the first seven bullets are all the different resources that I used when I was putting this together because I am still new to Florida. So learned a lot about native plants when I was building this uh, and even just about which birds are here at which time of year because for me, that's been a learning experience too. Um, coming from New England, the birds are obviously not overwintering. And so I've learned a, a lot in making this presentation from all these sources. Um, and I also have to finish off by saying, and Titusville Talking Points, which is a magazine. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen it, but what was really cool this year is I was at the Space Coast Birding and Wildlife Festival in February, and there was a January edition of Titusville Talking Points out, and I was just looking at it, and this was there. And I just thought this is the way to end this presentation uh, because they actually won an award um, on for from uh, the Florida section of the American Waterworks Association for this PSA because they they were talking about how native plants can reduce your water use, your water needs in your garden. And obviously this picture says it all. I mean, it reduces everything, your need for gasoline, your need for hard work. Uh, <laughs> but I just, I loved this so much and I thought it was a nice uh, way to plug native plants for people. Um, Cause you know, then you can just lay there and not have to do anything. Cause that's how gardens work, right? But uh, yeah. seriously though, I think natives have so many benefits beyond just attracting birds. But I'll, I'll, I will end it there and ask if anybody has any questions. Well, great, Kate, thank you so much. Um, I think um, you just covered so much good information and I hope that a lot of people, it looks like we only have about 25 or so watching right now, but if they watch it and replay, they'll be like, wow, can't believe those birds. Cause you have like that scarlet tanager, forget about it. They're just so gorgeous um, and you know, you're, keying in on the right things. It's the, not just the plant, it's the insects they draw, it's the fruit they bear. So um, I just, I just love the way you kind of rounded it off and, and made the way that those two things go together. Just, just fantastic. So thank you. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. Oh, thank you guys. Thank you. I can see the comments popping up. Thank you guys. I'm, it's such a, cool. Like I said, it's, it's strange. I know times are strange right now, but it's so cool to know that I am at a Florida Native Plant Society meeting and <laughs> I've missed these so much. And where are my free plants? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. What's the, the refreshments? Yeah. Right. Oh uh, yeah. Very, very. I miss, I miss our meetings for sure, but it's nice to at least be able to get together and talk about this stuff again, because it's Absolutely. very exciting. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, just moving on a little bit is um, we, the biggest thing we miss is the uh, actually walking people through the gardens in October. And of yeah. course, um, hopefully most people know that October is designated as native plant month. And so write your counselor, you know, do anything you want, just put a sign in your front yard and as people do a walk with their mask on, you know, say it's native plant month. So, um, awesome. we do, uh, we, we really appreciate that. And, um, and I love Jane's comment. I have to mention it because I agree. The birds have no idea that COVID-19 is a thing <laughs> and I love watching them too. And I will say whether they are coming to your yard or whether you're going for a walk somewhere, you should just go out and watch some birds because it does make, it does your heart good. It really does feel like things are more normal when you're out there in your garden or out in nature, listening to the birds singing and knowing that everything is the same for them. The world has not changed a bit in our natural areas. They are all, in fact, probably thriving from maybe a little bit less human activity. <laughs> and we've got enough time, but I know you've probably seen, I believe it was the uh, Audubon Magazine or the Nature Conservancy where it was showing pictures of birds that are not so uh, outgoing. 
and there were so few people around that they were like scattering themselves around. You could see some pictures of birds that you wouldn't normally see. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'll tell you what I'm going to tell you really, it's such an interesting mixed bag story. I'm going to tell you this story, which if you love squirrels, you're probably going to be upset. So, um, <laughs> But it, <laughs> for those of you who are like birds more than squirrels, you'll love this. <laughs> so uh, there were a lot fewer people at Rotary Park in March and April because they the built the nature center was closed. There were people in the park, but there weren't people around the Merritt Island Rotary Park Nature Center. So um, there were these two Cooper two Cooper's hawks who successfully reared three Cooper hawk Cooper's hawks babies. You know, and wow. they became juveniles and the squirrels had gotten extremely bold this spring in the bird feeder at the nature center because there were really no people. So the place was kind of overrun with squirrels. And then the Cooper's hawk showed up. And I don't know if anyone knows this in the audience, but Cooper's hawks like to also feed at your feeders, but they're not eating seeds if you get my drift. Um, but they are feeder birds. They will definitely hunt at your feeders. So. There are now almost no squirrels coming <laughs> to the feeder. And I do believe that COVID-19 had something to do with this because it made the squirrels really bold and carefree. And then we'd have like 12, 15 squirrels running around the feeder with, you know, no people to scare them away. And then the Cooper Sox showed up and went, oh, this is the best feeder I've ever been to. And uh, now we don't have any squirrels. Uh, <laughs> we have a couple, but they don't come to the feeder and they hide a lot. So yeah, it's just kind of a funny story about, yep. They got, a little too, they got a little too used to not having people around, I think. Hey. And uh, a little too bold. Yep. Circle, circle of life. So, <laughs> I, yeah, well, you know, I mean, if there's a bird lover, I'm going, yay, Cooper's Hawks, go. <laughs> They're, you know, they deal with so much. Let them have a break once in a while. There are, you know, are a lot more squirrels around than Cooper's Hawks. So, you know. That's funny. Yeah. Um, well. Yeah. Oh, it's so nice to see names on there. And, and I feel like I can see your faces, everybody. It's nice that you're here. <laughs> yeah. You'll, names you'll of people that I haven't seen in months and months, but I'm glad you're here tonight. Right. We, yeah, we, we don't feel that warmth and talk and all that stuff. And uh, don't forget to put your chairs up at the end as we leave <laughs> yeah. the meeting. So um, yeah. we really appreciate you talking to us and giving us that wonderful presentation, Kate. Um, I'm sure we'll have, once people watch the uh, recorded version, I'm sure we'll have more questions. So um yeah, but, and I didn't put my address on here or anything, but I'm happy to answer questions after the fact. I um, I don't know if maybe I'll just put it in the comments. Can I type in the comments? Let's yeah, find out I, if I can yeah. type into the comments. You can. That's I did that one. Yeah, I'm trying to get this onto my screen. Look, I'm having trouble. <laughs> um, hmm. We can do it after or include Actually, it in the not, If you stop sharing my last slide, I can do that because I need to pull that over onto my screen. Yeah, that'll work. Thank you. That's perfect. Uh, boy, it does not give me an option for some reason. I guess I cannot type over there. Well, here, um, perhaps you can type it for them. <laughs> Just your Kate Wells, 1977. It's K-A-T-H-R-Y-N. K-A-T-H-R-Y-N. It's, uh, wait, K-A-T-H-R-Y-N. K-A-T-H-R-Y-N. W-E-L-L-S. Yep, seven, seven. You see me typing it in? I uh, yeah, I don't know why I don't have the option to type in the box. That's I'm it. If anybody you. wants my email, that's the one. So <laughs> I think I'm I don't the know. captain of this little ship we're on. So who knows? Yeah, I guess because I'm the first time. <laughs> <laughs> That is the first time for us all. So um, I think we'll just go ahead and end the broadcast. And um, again, just keep in touch. We'll have a newsletter come out and it will talk about the native plant tour and that will also be virtual. So thank
Thank you for coming, everyone. And thank you so much, Kate, for your presentation. Oh, you're so welcome. I had a lot of fun. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.